to people are coming together to ensure the availability of secure and fairly priced housing in their area forever. Working together, they're creating homes on their own terms. In the last few months, we've seen just how important our homes, neighbours and communities are. And this experience has raised some fundamental questions about how we live and the kind of homes that we need. So what is community-led housing? It's when a group of people come together to build, manage and develop housing collectively. This might be developing the housings and building them themselves or taking ownership of an existing building or existing homes. And why would communities want to take collective control of housing? Firstly, it's resident-led. The people who know their homes are the people are the, the people that know their homes the best are the people who live in them. Residents often have solutions and not only work for themselves, but bring wider benefits to their area. And it's about transparency and accountability. Being part of an organisation means you have a role in making decisions and you're equally accountable to one another for the successful governance and running of that organisation. And community-led housing shares uh, some common principles. Firstly, that there is meaningful community engagement, that there is a long-term um, formal role in the ownership, stewardship or management of the homes, and that any benefit which may include affordability is legally protected in perpetuity. So in short, it means a group of people come together and they incorporate as a legal non-profit entity. So we are the enabling hub for London. We work across the capital on a wide range of projects and we're the first port of call for any new inquiries. This map shows all the recent emerging and existing community led housing projects and is actually available on our website in an interactive version. I'm sure there's actually more than what's on there as well. Um, and how does it come about? So it might come from a startup group looking, um, you know, starting from scratch might be an existing community organisation looking to provide housing um, and also comes forward through local authority opportunities which I'm sure Janet will be touching on later. The work we do is we support groups in the early stage so our team and advisors help guide mental and support groups thinking through different governance structures, ways they might build their homes and long-term management options. And there's funding available. In January 2019, the Mayor released the £38 million Community Housing Fund, which runs until 2023. We also support, um, we offer practical uh, support and advice to boroughs, developers and the housing associations on creating opportunities for community housing through small site releases or supporting policy. So this evening we're going to hear from three projects which we are involved with um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about the different types of um, community housing that they are part of as well. So first off we're going to hear from Salford Housing Cooperative and Martina. So just a little bit on a cooperative. A cooperative is democratically controlled by the cooperative's membership and each member has equal voting rights. So a fully mutual cooperative is where all the members are residents and all the residents are members. So if you move out of the cooperative, sorry, if you move into the cooperative, you become a member and you have a voting right. And when you move out, you leave the cooperative. Um, housing co-ops also retain and reinvest any surpluses from rent they have back into the homes they own and have the ability to lend to one another. So with 300 over 300 existing housing cooperatives in London, their collective borrowing power has the potential to deliver more affordable rented homes. So um, I'm going to pass you over to Martina now. Uh, Martina is a resident at Salford and founding member of CASH, Community Assets for Society and Housing. Uh, hello everybody, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm at my studio at the moment, which is next to Sanford, and it is one actually a building that is run by um, an artist um, charity. So we, one is helping the other uh, with the co-op. I, I will share my screen. Uh, I will first talk about Sanford Housing Co-op, 
and then I will do a little introduction of uh, CAS. Um, let me do it. So, um, I live in Sanford, I'm a member of Sanford Housing Coop, and I'm a development officer. Uh, Sanford has a lot of officers' roles in order to manage ourselves and try to outsource as little as possible. Uh, who we are? Uh, we are in uh, New Cross, um, close to New Cross uh, Gate Station, and we are approximately 120 members. Uh, we consist of uh, 14 houses, that uh, eight people live in each one, and a block of uh, uh, flats, uh, together with our beautiful garden and some uh, containers that we use for community communal um, use. Um, it's one acre site, and it was given for 75, 75 years of peppercorn lease in 1973 and we bought the freehold in 2015. So how Sanford came about, came into being. So we are an independent fuel mutual housing co-op, as Gemma said, uh, established in 1973. It was the first purpose-built housing co-op in Britain. Uh, and it happened when, uh, in 1968, a group of housing student activists uh, founded Sanford Cooperative Dwellings, SCD, originally planned to house 150 people and were now 120. Uh, it was built for the purpose of so-called young and mobile, and it was governed by the principles of mutual aid, no individual gain or economic exploitation, uh, create a community and avoid the isolation of the big city, and to for the purpose built not to drive low-income families out of home, homes, which then get given up uh, into single units and shared accommodations, uh, issues that we are uh, facing at the moment as well. So back in 1968, the SCD campaigned for five years, lobbying parliament and looking for land. Finally, in 1973, the government agreed to a pilot project directly land in Sanford Street between the two rail lines was identified as a potential site. Uh, Lewisham Council agreed to hand over the land on condition that no families were housed on a former industrial site. Uh, the housing corporation and the commercial union insurance company provided the finance with loans over 40 years, uh, with something, uh, something that will never happen today. Uh, and it was during this phase that BBC made a documentary uh, about the project called More Than a Place to Live. And you can find it on YouTube or in our website, sanford.coop. Even Prince Philip came to visit uh, as he was a long-term supporter of the scheme. Um, so Sanford opened in October of 1974 and one year later SCD transferred collective ownership of the buildings to the members. Um, yes, to, yeah, and actually, uh, yeah, sorry. So the cooperative movement was big at that time. Uh, there was a lot of government support. Uh, the Minister of Housing and Construction set up a working group in the early 70s to advise the government on how to support the construction of housing cooperatives. And there were other projects happening at the same time as the Launderette with Housing Association of Neighboring Council State, um, the Deptford Co-op for 140 young people, um, Borough of Newham, invited by the council on a former Rambis dump for 500 people, um, and many other, actually. So CDS today, uh, works in close relationship with the government's community-led housing in London and the National Community Land Trust Network, all of which are supporting uh, Sanford wherever they can, um, either with advice uh, or financial grants to bring our endeavors uh, to make more affordable and cooperative housing into fruition. Uh, so Sanford, in the 45 years of its existence, have done few projects. Um, 
And the question started from the first year of its inception, uh, what to do with the surplus uh, at the end of the year. So in 1974, Sanford House and Co-op held his, its first general meeting at Lewisham Town Hall and it was packed. Members had uh, supplied many of the services and management functions over the years, over this year, thus saving the Co-op a lot of money. So there was a huge discussion about what to do with the surplus, uh, whether it should be divided and paid back to the members, or if it should be saved to build communal facilities or more homes or whatever. Uh, in the end, the general uh, meeting voted for uh, that year's surplus to be divided in half and one part to go to further co-op education and the other half uh, to a local homeless charity. In 1981, um, the first community center was drop, uh, drawn up, but we don't know what happened. For sure, it didn't happen. Uh, in 2003, um, the members collectively commissioned a feasibility study by the Center of Sustainability Energy with aim to refurbish existing facilities, and we joined the C60 project which was uh, one million major refurbishment to reduce Sanford's carbon emissions by 60%. Uh, and an evaluation was conducted where Sanford had reduced its carbon emissions from 220 tons to 91 in 2008. Uh, we have also um, solar panels uh, where they provide the 30% of our community's energy needs. Another project was uh, the bike set in 2009, where um, uh, train slippers were used in order to create 80 bike spaces, and at the same time, uh, use the exterior as an amphitheater and uh, communal elevated gardens um, that we cherish and are part of our bigger gardens. So now, since 2015, we have been talking about community center to advance our community facilities and to build more housing as we have built quite a bit of surplus. Um, a feasibility study was conducted um, in 2017, uh, discussing where it is better to build more housing and the result was to build in our own land as it's the most feasible. Um, but at the same time, the members wanted uh, to better our uh, communal facilities and make opening it up to the community in general as well, to the broader community. So we did a competition, um, architectural competition, and 15 architects expressed interest. Uh, from those, uh, we chose Hayatsu architects uh, to build our community center and uh, investigate with the CLH funding uh, more housing. Um, so together with their uh, QS, uh, the quantity surveyor GLEADS, they identified uh, sites uh, within our land, but also with the encouragement of CLH, we started looking at the uh, adjacent plot of land, which is public as well. So this is our community center, which is proposed, and then there are different sites that are being identified within our plot, but outside as well. Um, so the next step, after drawing up the different possibilities, um, we have come to the conclusion uh, that uh, building on the adjacent plot would be much more appropriate uh, since we're building more and we can provide more affordable housing. So at the moment we are, um, uh, we have employed Catalyst to do a, phys a capacity, a feasibility study um, and uh, do a financial appraisal of the different options. And that's where we are at the moment uh, before uh, talking to the council first and uh, negotiating with them about the plot. Um, now for the community land trust that uh, I'm a board member of, uh, we joined in 2018 uh, members of, uh, to be honest, active members of uh, different uh, housing co-ops around Southeast London 
and we decided that we wanted to do something more efficient and uh, actually build more, uh, more cooperative housing because we believe in it. Uh, so we created uh, a community land trust, community assets for society and housing. We have been meeting regularly every, every three weeks. Uh, and it's, and yeah, we would like to utilize our experience in housing and working cooperatives in order to create more. Our structures are based on the cooperative principles. Um, we are a community benefit society as a legal entity. And we have participated in our outreach, although it has been limited through uh, due to um, uh, lockdown. Um, it has been limited to some internet uh, sessions, <laughs> but we have participated in uh, London Architectural Festival last year. We've done some uh, socials, we did uh, a field night, and we keep on thinking how to approach more people. Uh, at the moment, we got funding from CLAs to find more sites um, and identify three, the most prominent three of them, uh, in order to do cap draw capacity studies on them. Uh, and with the help of Catalyst, again, uh, do the financial strategy and financial appraisal of the sites. And that's where we are at the moment. Uh, we are welcoming you to join us in either in our one of our meetings or join our mailing list. Uh, everybody's welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martina. Um, I should I should add if you have quest if people in the uh, attendees have questions, please post them in the Q and A, and we will pick them up at the end of all the presentations, um, and invite you to to ask the question. Um, so please, if you have anything you'd like to ask, just post it in. Um, I'm just going to, and also I should say, we have um, over 50 people on the call as well. So uh, it's great to see everybody here. Um, so next we are going to uh, talk to Janet from Crystal Palace CLT. And I'm just going to say a little bit about what the Community Land Trust is. So community, community land trusts are open membership organizations that acquire, build, own, or manage homes within a defined geographical area, such as a neighborhood or a city. As an open membership organization, typically one pound membership entitles you to one vote in the organization. With an open membership, a CLT isn't just resident led, but includes members from the wider community. This means they're able to draw on a wider network of people, skills, expertise, and other resources, including funding. By joining the CLT, you can also stand to be elected onto the CLT's board, which the membership votes on annually. As well as being community-led, CLTs are used primarily as a way to, perfect, to protect affordability in perpetuity. An asset lock means the affordability is legally protected so that future residents will also benefit. Homes cannot be sold for inflated profits and any extra money the CLT earns or raises must be used for community benefit. So I'm now going to pass over to Janet. Following Croydon Council's release of the small site for community-led housing, the Crystal Palace Transition Town came together to establish a CLT. Um, and they're now looking to build homes at the lawns in South Norwood. So. I'm going to pass it over to Janet and I'm going to bring up your, with Laura, you bringing up the slides. Laura has the slides. Brilliant. I'm going to mute now. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm a, met a board member of uh, Crystal Palace Community Land Trust, but um, despite uh, Gemma's introduction down there, I don't actually qualify for full membership because I, although I did for many years live and work in the area, and I was actually born just down the road, um, I don't qualify because I don't live in the immediate area. So I'm a, a co-opted member, um, but I have been involved since the beginning. Um, if I could have the second slide, it just, Crystal Palace Community Land Trust grew out of the Crystal Palace Transition Town, which is a thriving transition town, which has been established for quite a few years, I think, um, which is the community-based initiative that aims to increase self-sufficiency locally and also promote a more sustainable lifestyle. 
Well, this shows the location of the lawns, which is our site. Um, uh, and you can, on the right hand side of the screen, you can see its location in London. Um, it's not actually South Nord, it's Crystal Palace. So it's SD19 as opposed to SD25, if we want to be completely accurate here. Um, uh, and there's a picture of the site on the left, an aerial view. Now, it's not very clear from the picture, but this is a really challenging site, which is presumably why it's never been previously developed. It's small. It's tucked at the end of a narrow road um, in, in the middle of an existing housing development with flats opposite, flats beside it, and some houses, a lot of houses further down the road. It's very, very steep, although once again, you can't really see that in that picture. And it has some services which run underneath the site. So it's got um, a, water, um, a, a water conduit going through it, and it has electricity going across the site. But it does have absolutely lovely views, and because it's high up, Crystal Palace has lovely views. And there's also a really lovely oak tree which is in the apex of the site, um, which, is, which is lovely. But this is, and quite understandably, this is protective. So once again, it adds another challenge to the site because we can't do anything that would obviously interfere with the tree. So that takes up quite a bit of the point. Um, but it is a lovely site. Um, uh, so that, that's our site. Um, and what we want to develop, um, uh, if we can go on to the next slide, please, Laura. We want to develop homes um, that are as affordable as possible with priority for local residents. We want everyone that wants to, to be involved in the design and delivery process. So we've got um, a group of local residents together to help us, to help inform the design process. We want this to be sustainable. We want it to be um, so that local, that the residents moving into the homes in due course, we're only for passive house standard, but don't think we'll quite get there, but definitely it will be low carbon, so it will be much cheaper to run and they will be much more sustainable. We want more green space for local residents um, and there will be a community garden to promote local food growing. It is actually something that Transition Town has quite a lot of experience on, sort of setting up little community gardens around Crystal Palace. So that's something where there's a bit of experience already, which is good. And we want um, volunteering, training and jobs prioritised for local residents and firms not just in delivery in the homes, but also in a range of community activities, including gardening and community development. So that's something that we've got in sort of our vision for a bit further on. Um, uh, if we go on to the next um, slide, um, I think this is really what shows what we think is, what we bring that's a bit extra here. Um, uh, in terms of the, the model that we're operating, um, we'll be pioneering the partnership between a council-owned property company, brick by brick, um, and a community-led housing group, which would be the first in London. Um, brick by Brick are Croydon Council's owned uh, property development company, um, and they will be working with us certainly on the first stage of the scheme. So this will be a first, pretty interesting. Um, uh, we will help to unlock a very difficult site with community participation in the design and the development process. I think at this point I should say that actually community involvement is really important. I mean, A, we were motivated by community involvement in the first place, it fits with the model of community-led housing. But quite frankly, if we really if we can't get the community on our side, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to get planning permission. There are a couple of other sites locally, one further down the, down the road, where similarly the council are trying to get it to develop, and local residents are really anti the site. It's come up with graffiti, actually saying we don't want this site developed. So it's really important just in practical terms that we, we, we do work with the community and we do bring them with us. We're pushing for higher standards um, as we've said um, in terms of sustainability um, and the CLT status will ensure that the housing remains genuinely affordable for local people. And it's not just homes, we are really wanting to give something back to the community. So as part of our looking at what we could do there, our initial work, um, one of our project boards um, identified that um, a new a location we could actually put a footpath in, which will open up pedestrian access for a shopping parade, and even more importantly, the local bus stop. And it takes a significant amount of time um, off the time it takes to walk from the current site to the bus stop. So in terms of just giving everybody um, a bit more of it, it's such an obvious thing to do, but we had, it hadn't been spotted before until we started looking at this. So hoping the footpath, which will actually open things up, the community garden, which, as I say, will and will encourage local people to get involved in 
called Surfer for Food Growing. Um, and we've started trying to bring in the local primary school, the design competition, and our logo in the top right hand corner, that's courtesy of um, Port Saint Primary School. Um, if we could go on to the next slide, please, slide, please, Laura. I was asked to answer the question, what motivated us to start? And I think I could summarise it as opportunity and luck. The opportunity arose when Croydon invited bids for community-led housing on the lawn site. It was already a sympathetic local culture with the transition town, which is very much about community involvement and sustainability. And there's also a local resident, very involved in the Commission Town, who's very aware of community-led initiatives, Tom Chance, who's actually the Joint Chief Executive of the National Network of Community Land Trust. So um, I think this, this is sort of the opportunity and the luck. Um, Tom sort of uh, got a group of people together, local networking led different people being invited along. I was invited because somebody in the transition town knew I had a housing background um, and that I might have some time to put into it. So. Um, group of us got together first meeting in May um, in the local cafe, which is now our Flinty Cafe, which is now our registered address. Um, and out of that meeting, a very strong project emerged. And I think this is also part of the luck, because it was a group of people that were all interested, and we stayed very interested, and collectively, we have very strong professional skills between us, as well as a big commitment to keeping things local. Um, so the team got together. We prepared and submitted our bid within two months, which is pretty fast, um, and we won in August 2019. So that was really our motivation, and that's that's where we came from. Um, so say, but opportunity and luck. Um, and now it's our job to really make sure it works. And just have the next slide. We've got some pictures, really. I think. Um, you know, this shows what we've done to date. So the top right-hand corner are the children of the local school who participated in the design competition. The bottom right-hand corner shows one of the community events that we held on the site, the Croydon Council facilitated, but we were all there um, last summer, where we got local residents to come out and actually identify concerns they had about the site. We had a lot of very vocal feedback um, to add to the information we already had. And then the left-hand side, um, the, the picture of the site, just shows some of the things that really happened. So I think that the yellow thing is probably a sun survey because it's really important in terms of passive house um, standards that we know where the, the alignment starts of the sun and the shade and everything else like that. So I think that's what that yellow sign means, but it's just really an indication that we're underway with the various surveys that are necessary. we have the next slide, please. And um, this shows who we are and how we started. So you've got the, that is our governance structure really. On the left-hand side, we've got the transition town, um, and we maintain the links with the transition town because it's all part of the local um, uh, a, a local initiative. Then there's Community Land Trust Board, which links uh, onto the project board. So we've set up a project board, which at the moment there's a lot of overlap between board members and the project board. But we have we have big plans. So in the future there'll be more than one project, and we we'll have plenty of project boards. Um, but at the moment there is a big overlap in terms of the membership. Um, so the project board, oops, um, uh, and as you said, there will always be a link though to the actual Community Land Trust Board. And we've got a residence design group that's now been set up, so they're an extension um, of the project board. And then on the right hand side, there are our critical partners here. It's Croydon, who currently own the site that we're working with, um, obviously, brick by brick, the development company I mentioned earlier. And then there's our sort of partners, the design team, RPO, um, uh, and the various um, consultants that we work with. Um, next slide, please. Here's our resident design group. Um, a series of people locally who've actually come together um, and who are working with the architects um, to actually sort of start looking at what they think with what we should be doing with the site. Now obviously it's really important that we don't set up, um, uh, we don't allow people to think that they've got complete control over what we decide, there's obviously constraints on what people can input on what we can do with it. But within those constraints we are really keen that it's local people who drive what we do. And interestingly, um, I, I haven't been part of this so far, but I understand that some of the first um, feedback that we've had from the residents that design group is that actually I think it's really important that the housing we build on the lawns is actually let rather than marketed, but rather than sold. So that's going to provide an interesting challenge in terms of how we actually might get ourselves, uh, perhaps partnering with someone else, who knows, but how we could get ourselves to the point where we might be able to raise funding that actually allows us to actually build and rent um, 
food balancing. But we'll see how we go on that one. So that's the resident group. I think the next slide just gives a quick synopsis of the, the, um, the, uh, yeah, the demographics um, of the project board um, uh, and uh, the, sort of the, the interest that they've got in the backgrounds. Um, and then the next picture just shows our project board, uh, our, I'm sorry, our CLT board, I think. Can you have the next one, please? Yeah, so that, that is our project, um, our CLT board. Um, and you can see beside the names, people from professional backgrounds. So we've got um, a couple of architects, a planner, um, someone on the um, Community Land Trust Network, um, someone who's in marketing, um, Vishal, who's our treasurer, who's in investment. And as I said earlier, my background is the sort of housing association and, and policy works as part of that. So um, for the early stages of actually sort of start up, um, it's been a very strong board, but obviously boards change and as you move on, you need different skills on there. But for the startup, I think we were, um, we've been a strong board and we're still hoping to fill one or two more places on that board. Um, uh, the next picture, please. Um, yeah, this is, I think this is it really. This is where we are at the moment. So we formally appointed Brick by Brick, um, and then B by B, or BXB, um, as our development uh, managers to take us through to the planning side of things. We've agreed the heads of terms to buy the land from Croydon Council, um, a stage with that mention. Um, we've appointed architects with the experience of working with the community. This is really important. And this has thrown up some conflicts for us, I suppose, because we're really keen to actually, all the, you know, all the work that we let out from our scheme um, goes to local people. But then you start to try and balance that with the need to actually have specialist architects who've got experience of working with the community or appointing solicitors who understand community land trust, and that isn't easy. So um, we, I'll, I'll be honest with you, um, our procurement means that we've had to stretch local a little bit and actually <laughs> appointing our professional um, uh, consultants and advisors, but we're putting in now some more local um, as we go on, I hope. Um, we've got the resident design group workshops underway, um, the series through the autumn, and uh, we've applied to the GLA for funding to take us um, through to planning application stage. We hope to get planning permission um, in May 2021 when the next stage kicks off. Um, and I think that's it. I think the last slide is just um, a sketch. Yeah, this is just a sketch of, our, of the bid we put into the council. Um, this was our original proposals, which would have been four houses um, set back from the road so that we're not actually overlooking anyone, that we're not interfering with the views from the flats opposite. And we do have lovely views at the moment. We've got community garden out the front. Um, uh, and everything is as aligned as it can be. Um, so that's what we put in. Um, so that was for four homes. Um, the council were hoping someone would provide nine homes on the site. And I think our expectation is that once we get the design finalised, we probably... Uh, Janet, I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop. We, we've completely lost you uh, in terms of... Um, I've finished. Audio. <laughs> I've finished anyway. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's much better. If, if, if there was one thing you wanted to say to kind of wrap it up, then um, otherwise uh, we can uh, bring it. No, with, that's fine. With the questions at the end. Thank you. It was fine up until the last, uh, the last kind of thirty seconds or so. Oh, it's probably, it's probably because I relaxed and I stopped being on my best behaviour. <laughs> We've also recorded this session um, and I've seen that a few people didn't hear that. So when we, uh, when we share the video, um, we can see if there's something we might be able to do um, to make what that Janet was saying more audible. Um, and our final, pan uh, our final panelist this evening is Aswari from E16 CLT. Uh, E16 CLT was founded in 2018 by the People's Empowerment Alliance for Custom House. Well, um, known as Peach, as a resident-led response to the stored regeneration of the area. Um, and I think you're going to have a conversation with my colleague Rowan now about uh, EC, uh, the E16 CLT project, which he's also working on. Thanks. Thanks, Gemma. Um, yeah, just to, for everyone's um, awareness, um, Aswari has very kindly to step in at the last minute. Um, uh, so with, without wanting to kind of put you too much on the spot, we thought we'd kind of structure this presentation as more of a discussion um, um, because you didn't really have much time to prepare. Um, but we do have some slides. So maybe 
Um, we'll go through the slides and um, I can kind of ask you some questions about the project uh, as we go. Um, um, and it's, it's a project I've been uh, closely involved with, with as well. So, um, um, can I say a few words first? Or? Yes, say as much as you like, please. <laughs> um, I'm also a PEACH member, um, People's Empowerment Alliance for Custom House. And uh, I just want to mention people's power is powerful, as we have seen uh, Peach's efforts in uh, um, and contribution in enabling the council to terminate the MIAS contract. Um, um, the MIAS contract, uh, I think everyone understands that contract. They were um, uh, sublet by the council to look after the tenants, but they weren't uh, um, uh, what you call uh, dealing with, with it efficiently. So um, the uh, residents wanted the council to terminate the contract and uh, it ended recently. Also, um, um, the regeneration prompted me to join E16 CLT as we, as, uh, we shop kibbles. I'm a shopkeeper and I've been in custom house for over uh, 33 years. And, um, uh, and the residents of custom house are in the same predicament. We desire affordable homes and shops with affordable rent. Um, we realize the future is dependent not only on outside factors, but our individual input is paramount to create a home each of us would like to live in. Also shopkeepers too, won't be displaced when regeneration takes place. Okay, I've sort of introduced myself. Thank you. Thanks, Cesare. Um, go to the next. What are you able to? Um, so this, it gives an interest in uh, what their approach is and uh, something that I know that Peach was um, um, with, uh, led uh, early on in this process um, is the development of an alternative regeneration plan. Um, and that was something that came out uh, in response to um, the council's own um, developer-led regeneration plan some years, uh, some years previously. So um, there was a lot of organising that took place um, to, to develop a, a, a kind of counter narrative and, a, and a, an alternative proposal to, to the council's plans. I was just wondering, Asfari, um, what the, um, the, the vision for, 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 the C, for, the, for the CLT is, um, because it, it came out of Peach, didn't it? Um, uh, with a, with a, a very a kind of specific uh, goal, um, the, the, the alternative regeneration plan dealt with uh, a, a lot of issues across the estates, but the, and the CLT has a, has, has a more kind of uh, focused uh, vision. Uh, Peach was the mother, and um, uh, E16 CLT came up came about later, and uh, the uh, but uh, we are both joining in and creating more affordable homes and homes uh, that are sustainable and. Uh, also uh, conducive to uh, uh, living accommodations that everybody would like to live in. Uh, uh, as presently, the residents have various problems with the uh, council apartments, uh, present uh, accommodation. So uh, I think it will be ideal if um, the community led housing that where the community have a, a input in what is going on yes yeah and that that alternative regeneration plan involved knocking on thousands of uh, of people's doors and um i just wonder as a as a shop owner uh, within the area um what what's what are the challenges that you faced um uh, with relate with relation to the the regeneration and the council Oh, uh, we had um, lease problems. The lease expired and the council were, uh, was not keen to renew the lease. 
after much negotiation and uh, 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 appeal by lawyers, uh, we finally extended the lease, but there's a break clause. So that uh, prevents us from uh, selling the lease at a competitive price. And uh, we are, um, my husband is 80 now. So uh, we are forced to continue our retirement having the business. And uh, recently, personally, we found, uh, it's my experience, we found a buyer and the council has is taking more than four months to reassign the lease. It's causing a lot of stress because at our age, we have to manage the shop and the employees, which is very difficult. And we'd like to enjoy the few years left in retirement. So many shopkeepers face this problem in that area. And also, uh, ideally, we were waiting for the regeneration to take place, but it wasn't forthcoming as we, as promised. It started nearly 10, 15 years ago the promise of regeneration, but it hasn't taken place as yet. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we go to the next slide. Um, this is a, uh, kind of just summarizes uh, how the uh, CLT was formed. Uh, and it just echoes what Aswari was saying, um, that the objectives were for the benefits to be retained for local people, um, that it's, not for profit or for personal gain, but for the for the communities as a whole. Um, that it is owned by its membership, um, and this is a kind of common theme for the groups that we're work, uh, we've got here today. Um, um, that one member has one vote, and that the housing, importantly, kind of stays affordable forever. Uh, and I know, that in addition to that, there's also a, a real emphasis on um, an additional services, so community centres and shops that. Uh, that are kind of run for and by local people as well. Um, as far as I just wonder if you could share some uh, of your kind of experiences from work, from being on the board um, of the CLT. What's what's that process been like in terms of how you've worked together and what you've what you've learned? Um, I have been sort uh, um, uh, um, uh, member who who watched uh, what was going on and um, um, I did uh, contribute by emails uh, because I'm not such an eloquent speaker um, but um, I, I, the E16 CLT has taught me a lot how the community uh, have a people's power in in getting what uh, they uh, they deserve or we deserve, and a joint uh, um, cooperation, cooperative work will help achieve what we need in Custom House, because Custom House has long been neglected, and the residents too have suffered, and shopkeepers, and um, CLT has given us hope. hope for the future. And um, so, um, you know, uh, I have been happy uh, to join and be a member of CLTs so that, uh, and if in any way I can help in the future, even if I leave um, uh, uh, the area as a shopkeeper, I'll be happy. Thank you. Thanks, Asari. Um, I'm just, uh, I'll go to the next slide and I'll, um, I've got some notes here from, um, from the, the speaker who couldn't, uh, couldn't make it. Um, so on the regeneration itself, the project uh, aims to address the needs of local people, especially those losing their homes through the estate regeneration and custom house. Um, these range from leaseholders who bought their homes under right to buy and now cannot afford a new place within the, um, with the compensation that is offered by the council, to temporary tenants who had no rights at all, um, to be rehoused. Um, so they, the CLT has now identified some sites within the wider regeneration area, um, which they uh, are championing for CLT homes. Um, and we, they are close to um, closing a, a feasibility study on those sites, uh, which I think you can see on the next slides. 
Um, so these are two sites, um, one within the regeneration area and one just uh, on, the, on the border of it. Um, they are currently working with, uh, maybe actually if we go to the next slides, what we can achieve. Um, we, they're currently working with um, architectural consultants and financial consultants um, that uh, we at the Hub have uh, supported them in, um, in appointing uh, and clienting that. Um, so we're go going through that process uh, to finalize their proposals for, for those two sites. Um, and, and through that process, it's really been a, in a kind of learning, uh, a learning exercise in, in um, really understanding what, what it is they want to achieve in terms of the long-term aspirations for those homes. Um, so what, what is it about the management of homes uh, and the control that, um, uh, that, that they want for their residents um, that they want to be um, uh, kind of negotiating for and, and championing uh, with the council. Um, so I will leave that there. Um, I think we can definitely answer more questions on E16 uh, between myself and Aswari um, in the next section. Um, Gemma, I don't know if you wanted to um, come back and close that bit. Um, yeah, so um, just thank you to um, all three of our presenters for presenting. Um, we'd like to take questions from everybody, um, all, the, all the attendees. So if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A button at the bottom. And what will happen is I will invite you to um, join us on the call and you'll be able to ask your question. And just to say we are recording the session. So um, if you do come onto the, onto the call, you will be recorded. Um, we do have a couple. So first of all, I'm gonna bring Anne in. Um, she has a question for um, Martina. So if I just. There we go. There we go. Yep. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Anne. I'm from uh, Co Housing London East. We're a very new group. Uh, hoping to build something and form something in East London. And so I had a question about um, site finding really. How did you go about it? Obviously it's very complicated. Land is very expensive. There's so many actors involved. And I just had, um, I just wondered how your site finding went and how the negotiations uh, went on and really how did the opportunity came about. And then another one for Janet as well, which was more about how you mentioned uh, there's a preference for renting rather than buying. Uh, and I thought that was really interesting because we often think about community-led housing as really having that new sense of ownership uh, to have more control. But if you have a secure uh, way of renting, then that actually is also a very good solution. So I was really interested to hear about your perspective as well, well the perspective of the residents. Um, hi, Anne. I will talk Although COPs are uh, on the same principle, the second question that you had about Jane is that if you have secured land and the building, um, the point is that collectively you own and you have empowerment, but not individually. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's, that's the principle of uh, COP housing as well. Mm -hmm. uh, for the site sales, it's been a long and ongoing process um, that was diverting us in many different places. Um, uh, we followed two paths. One, and we are still, we haven't found the site, we haven't identified uh, a site, uh, because we were looking at both uh, private and public and uh, different scales, because we were trying to identify without having a client co-op, let's say, uh, we were trying to log as much data and with the land inside access, uh, uh, as much uh, information and as much land as we could. Uh, but also we employed the on foot method and going cycling and trying to find different sites and then using land inside uh, to identify them and find more information. Uh, we also used um, who we know because we know people in the area and we are local. So we were, um, and because we are a, a lot of us architects, engineers, and we have clients in the neighborhood as well. So we were trying through the who we know. Um, and we came to, and also 
because it's not for us, we are a CLP, so we're not all of us clients, let's say. Uh, from Jay, um, particularly around um, uh, what's the case for community-led housing? Um, I wonder if uh, let's invite. Uh, Thank you, Nadine. Someone doing that? Hi, Jay. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, thanks for the wonderful presentation. So it was very interesting. Um, yeah, I had a question on the processes and the, uh, yeah, like you say, the cases for council-led housing. I mean, not council, community-led housing. But I was just wondering what the what are the processes you need to go through to get this approved by a council? And in the case of small sites programs, how does a CLH project take priority over something like social rent? So I'm, I might, uh, I think there's, there's a number of answers to that, but I think it'd be interesting to draw on our, some of our panelists. Uh, I wonder, Janet, if we can hear you, um, it would be good to kind of hear about the, the just exactly how the, the, the site was released um, by Croydon and, um, and what tenures you're providing uh, or you're, you're proposing to provide. So whether um, you're able to provide affordable or social uh, and, and how, how that how you're balancing that um, because I think that that latter, latter part of your question Jay comes down to viability um, which maybe we can touch on later um, can you hear me yes but you're quite Am I uh, shouting? broken up um, if maybe you can turn your camera off that might help Right. Does that make it better? Yes, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. No. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I don't think I've got much to add in terms of the process because, as I say, we started because there was a competition to put bids in to develop affordable or to develop community-led housing on the site. So we came in with a site already there that we were competing for. Um, so I, I don't think I can add much to that. I mean, you guys at the CLH are obviously are better equipped to answer that question. In terms of our tenures, um, in our initial bid, we were hoping that we would be able to have some rented, uh, but we also knew we would have to sell some um, at um, slightly below market rents to actually help fund it because we didn't think it would be viable. But now we're going through the, um, the, de the formal design. We can't really do our viability until we know exactly what the design is um, and exactly what the cost will be. So um, it was very interesting that people on our design group are very keen that we actually try and get it all um, rented. Now, I don't think that will be possible unless we can partner with um, perhaps registered housing association or somebody else but I don't know the ins and outs of that. The board haven't had a chance to discuss it. So I don't think I've got very much to add, Jay. I'm really sorry. I think the CLH are probably better equipped to answer your question than I am. So I'll go to Martina and then uh, Lev um, come in as well. Sorry, uh, yes, on this I have uh, uh, one quest two questions. Uh, one, uh, that the GLA small sites from, as far as I remember, uh, they were given uh, in order to create 100% affordable housing. I think that was the part of the competition. If I remember correct, I participated in one in Brixton. 
um, some years ago. Uh, so it was not viable to have a affordability, to have affordable housing. And what, and, sorry, here. Uh, and what is affordable housing in that case? I would like to ask uh, the panel, everybody, what do you mean? What do we mean affordable housing? And the question, the second question to Jane, uh, if she could elaborate, what does it mean partnership between the council owned brick by brick and the CLT? What, is, what does it entail exactly? Lev, do you want to pick up some of those? I, I just thought I would come in on the, um, the, the, the sort of small sites process and why councils might want to do this. Um, so it's by no means everything they're doing. So clearly, if you take the example of Croydon, um, they have a cabinet approval to release up to five sites, I think, specifically for community-led housing. But clearly they are working on, I don't know how many other sites, maybe 20, 50 other sites um, through Brick by Brick, their arm's length company. And they do a range of tenures, um, and I think community-led housing can do a range of tenures. So it's not necessarily one particular uh, form. So a lot of house historic housing co-ops um, do social rent. Um, viability is challenging on small sites for anyone, um, whether it's the council doing the development or a community-led housing organisation doing the development. I think um, in the case of the sites that have been specifically set aside for uh, community-led housing, um, there's, there's an expectation of a proposal, but as Martina pointed out, there was an um, expectation that it should be 100% affordable, different tenures possible within that, but that has an effect on the land value. And if you compare that to the council, building on its own land if they're not expecting a land value it's more or less the same with a community-led housing organization just to give another example that Rowan might be able to say a bit more about as well um, we're working with Tower Hamlets um, who have a similar approach and I can say their numbers I think they've got a target of about 2,000 council homes council built on infill on council estates um, but also a target of um, 50 community-led self-built homes. So it just gives you a sense of, you know, that 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 is a sort of less than 5% of the overall. So I think it's a recognition um, within councils that this isn't, community-led housing isn't the answer to everything, but it's got a role to play. It can have these kind of wider social benefits of empowerments and um, community control. And um, it tends to be on the slightly more trickier, smaller sites that councils, that may not be as efficient for the council to do themselves. Um, and I'd say it's about presenting that case on a site-by-site -site basis. Hope I haven't gone yeah. too long. No, I think, I think, a pick up on something which is that um i don't that there isn't one set route uh to um finding a site acquiring a site uh and uh, and realizing and delivering homes on it um one of the routes that uh is becoming more increasingly available in london is this kind of council-led uh approach where they're releasing sites exclusively for community-led housing um and with the affordability requirements on that um really depend on what's what's viable um, but there's always an aspiration that those homes are affordable um, and then there's a, there's other approaches to acquiring sites uh, which um, I can uh, we can introduce um, someone to talk about in a second uh, but you know that the, the, the discussion around sites with a council can also be kind of have a strategic strategic importance um, for, for a kind of wider project um, in fact I might bring up um, introduce um, Mabel who's just joined us um, who wasn't able to join us earlier from E16 CLT um, uh, and, and the reason for that is that uh, the, the sites that they're looking at um, they are, are being um, they're, they're doing feasibility on those sites to to, to, to see what they can um, deliver as a CLT themselves but also 
uh, there's a there's a wider strategic importance for uh, kind of demonstrating that with the council. Mabel, are you there? Ah, hey. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> Technical issues. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Maybe, Apologies, uh, I tried. I drove <laughs> as fast as I could. We're landing traffic. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all right. Uh, just, if you, maybe you just introduce yourself. Um, and uh, what, one thing, so we touched on quite a lot uh, in the uh, presentation with Aswari is um, kind of how the CLT was formed. Um, yeah. It would be good to um, have uh, a bit of insight as to, into kind of What's happening now with the sites, and why are they? Why why those sites? Because you don't actually own those sites. Yeah. Um, so the questions could be asked as to why you uh, developing proposals for sites that you don't actually own. Um, okay. so it would be interesting, I think, to kind of hear a bit about what, how how that process is, what the kind of yeah importance of that process is okay. in, in the long term. Yeah. Uh, my name is Mabel, everyone, and I'm a member of the E16 CLT board and i've been involved with pitch for quite since many years a uh, few years i was about five or six years now and for me the reason why i joined the clt board was originally because i was on the alternative regeneration plan that pitch had done to work uh, in connection with the council uh, for housing and therefore um when the opportunity came to have a to potential is um, community land trust i said okay i think those expertise and knowledge of working with architects can be put into further use so yeah i'm just a resident in new home uh, custom house so to my understanding these sites that um we have decided to choose yes we do not owe any any land in new home unfortunately we hope one day maybe <laughs> we can be is because Whilst doing the regeneration alternative plan, we went around through the whole community and we found meanwhile uses. So we have pieces of land, like for example, behind my property that has either overgrown not being kept. We have a shed available that used to be a youth center that has not been used for many years. And we have homes that have also been emptied and squatters were coming in. So when we went around, when we went around, we had areas that we could actually do something at the meantime for the community and then in the long term maybe look for a bigger land so our lands are not really massive it's just something simple but that can contain um, can provide housing in the immediate needs and we also because we did the region alternative regeneration we went with the council to find out which areas the council is trying to build on first so we have area B going after, I think I believe to E, and it's going in phases. So once we identify these areas, we realize that, okay, if the council is build as close to area A, then why can't we get a E16 community in it? So the, oh, it says my internet is, can you guys hear me? You're cutting out a little bit, but we're, I think we're okay. Oh, sorry, I, it just came out that my internet was poor. So the whole aim at the moment is to try and work alongside the council, do a feasibility study for this um, land that we have seen within the uh, community and um, hopefully gets approved and then take it from there. So we are hoping, let's say, if the council start, we will also have our piece of land. And if we can get that security of starting our own E16, uh, community land trust, then as the phases are going, we can then again work with the council and um, get more E16 CLT within the phases. So at the moment, we are just on the feasibility study. We had a review, a discussion last week uh, with the landlord. We had a look at the plan in terms of the type of tenure and the type of housing, the first time I ever heard of the micro, is it micro room or micro study of micro studio, which was very interesting. And we had quite a few discussions in terms of the um, suitable for the land size. Are we taking a lot of space if we had to bring these things in and that? So, so far, we're just hoping that the feasibility study 
will be approved and then make on that board. But I will be interested to know and find out because I came in late. I don't know. Have anybody here got maybe, do you guys own a land? And how did you acquire a land? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Mabel. Uh, yeah, uh, so um, I think the, 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 for me, the kind of really interesting thing about uh, um, your project is, is exactly what you're talking about. It's, it's kind of using the feasibility study as a way of uh, kind of um, convincing the council that, that uh, you have the capabilities and the, um, the credibility to, to, take on, uh, to take on homes. Um, uh, just to let you know that, so Janet, who's on the call, is from um, Crystal Palace CLT. They were awarded a site by the council through the council's own process. Um, and Martina, um, who's uh, got your hand up, and you also had a, uh, a question for Janet, which uh, we can kind of bring back as well. Yeah, I wanted to ask, I wasn't clear. Uh, you're asking through the feasibility study for the council to release the site zero peppercorn value. That's your aim? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, at the moment, because we are just still on the initial stages. We are learning as we go along. And yes, so we just, we need, uh, we try to get more guide, uh, guidance, work with the architects from the council as well. And mm -hmm. say, this is what we propose. What do you think? And then hopefully by considering our plan and our thought through of what the community wants, they may be able to approve and then hopefully give us a land to, yeah. And your negotiation is to own the land or to lease it for? That is a good question because <laughs> to be honest with you, I'm not uh, sure in terms of um, what, I think at this moment, whatever is the best deal at the moment, it is to lease because it's our first opportunity. If after consulting solicitors, if that seems to be the right way to go, then we can um, agree on it. But we would love to own one, and not as a lease, but in terms of due to maybe finance or with the E16 CLT being newly, you know, trust as well, capability and everything else. Maybe the council might not be too keen to just give the land or we might not be in the position to purchase the land. And therefore, if leasing is an opportunity for us to start something to prove ourselves, I believe that might be an option. Okay, thank you. I think that kind of tells uh, one, uh, something that's quite true of projects at this stage is that uh, there's a lot of options are on the table. Uh, and I know that's definitely the case for E16 and another, another a number of projects we're working with. Um, I think it's, it's good to have a kind of clear idea of exactly what it is you, you, you require and in, in, in terms of the control that you want. But that might look uh, like there may be several different options to achieve that, which might be to do with ownership, it might be to do with lease, leasing, it might be to, to do with just ma having control over the management of the homes. Um, and uh, so at this stage, there's, uh, there's a pro the, the process of doing that feasibility uh, or kind of feasibility on any site is, um, is, is as much an exercise in just going through that process and, and being forced into making those decisions um, uh, it's highly likely that those decisions or those um, may change kind of further down the line, um, but it gives you a kind of base from which to have uh, negotiations and conversations with the council. Um, I can see we've got a question from Roy, but I, um, I think Martina, Martina, you had um, a question for Janet. Uh, Yes, uh, on the, um, let's say on the um, uh, diagram that uh, uh, she showed about how the structure of the CLT is working and it's the CLT board, then it's the project board and then it's brick. I don't understand the relationship of the brick by brick with the CLT and who owns what, what is the responsibilities, what is the relationship? Janet, are you there? You're muted. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear yes. me? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I've just, oh, the, the structure, yeah. So the brick by brick are the council's um, arms length development company, completely owned by the council 
um, and any, um, any surplus they make um, goes back um, into council to sort of fund other activities. Um, it was a requirement or a very, very strong encouragement from Croydon that whoever took on this site, who have got this site, actually did work with Brick by Brick as their sort of development agent. Um, uh, now, we don't have to do that, but there's a very strong incentive. Um, and certainly up until I think it's the planning stage, um, we don't have to pay the same fees to brick by brick that we would if we had to use um, a, another, um, a, another, you could go by another option. Um, so the, financially, it makes sense. Um, and, um, but we've been very keen to make sure that the local community realise that although brick by brick are very involved in this, they are actually, um, we are the client. Um, and I think that's taken a bit sometimes to sort of, um, perhaps to get that message across. We think it's quite important because, um, I mean, we don't know, you just speak as you find, and we've found brick by brick very good to work with, but on, pre on some other sites that they developed the council, for whatever reason, there seems to have been a bit of community backlash. So we think it's really important that we do make it clear that we are the client. Um, as I say, so far, we've been very pleased. The person who's actually acting as our development manager, um, she's very good. And we've got very sort of, um, we've agreed exactly how much delegated authority she has. Um, to do things without coming back to us because obviously she needs some flexibility but the, we've just said as part of a governance process we've actually agreed um, uh, exactly what delegated authority I say um, uh, she should have um, and the governance structure basically is that the project board is essentially a, a sub subcommittee um, of the board and so the board um, it's the board that delegates the authority to the project board to for example proceed with the design or whatever um, uh, and it's the project board that delegates the responsibility to brick by brick at the moment um, to actually act as our development manager. I'm not sure, Martina, if that answers your question or not. Yeah, just I find it because I work in construction and normally you have, uh, uh, you do bids in order to decide because they create the viability uh, report if, and they set the standards of how how much will this project cost? And then it goes from there, how much affordable housing you can provide. It's all linked. And it's just peculiar that there is one company um, assigned without a bidding for it. That's, well, that's, that's my wonder. And uh, that's what I'm trying to get to understand. Yeah. Uh, but remember, they are the council's arms length development com uh, company. They are working on a lot of sites across, across Croydon for the council. Um, we have separate architects, uh, but we are very much in control because obviously we don't have the legal responsibility for this. And as I said earlier, um, luck, judgment, whatever, pr from a professional point of view, we've actually got a very strong board at the moment with several architects, the planner. Um, so I think, um, I think we are well placed because this is Croydon's first experience of this. I think we are well placed to have a robust discussion with Croydon and brick by brick when it's needed. Um, but hopefully we've all at the end of the day got the same aim. So I'm optimistic, Mart <laughs> Martina, we'll see. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's been, yeah, it's been great to, to have some questions being really delving into the detail. Uh, I'm also aware that um, there's probably a lot of people on the call who um, I'm fairly new to community-led housing and we've got a question from Roy um, who if you're still there uh, it'd be great to answer your question because uh, it seems as if you're coming uh, to this afresh and uh, uh, have some questions for our colleagues. Oh, hello. Hi. 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 Oh thanks. Yes completely new first time so pleased to be joining um, but yeah completely new to this uh, community housing Sounds all fascinating. Martina in particular was really inspired by the story. So I really just wanted to know from someone starting from scratch, you know, where, where, where do I start? Um, should I literally try and get together a bunch of like-minded people and form a group? I, I mean, um, and then the second half of my question was, you know, who pays for things like feasibility studies, architect, designer, you, you know, just um, yeah, yeah. What's step one, two, and three? <laughs> Please, I'm, I'm sure you got an answer on that. You might point me to your website, but um, any assistance most welcome. Thanks, Roy. Um, I wonder. Um, 
I, I keep, okay, uh, Martina, I was, I just, it'd be also good to hear from, uh, from Mabel as well. Martina. Yeah, I, I would uh, just say just join a group, uh, depending which area you are. Um, I don't know, which area are you? Right? Wandsworth. Wandsworth. Uh, we are all South London uh, CLTs. Ideally, you should join first uh, one of the CLTs and uh, explore uh, the strategies, the governance, meet people, and from there on, uh, educate yourself first, and then uh, see if it suits, uh, if community-led housing suits you or not, or, yeah. I would say first, uh, join, join us. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks, Martina. I, th I think as well, there's, there's, uh, there's always a kind of common need so um, the question I'd have for you first is, is what's, the, what's the need that you have that, um, that, that a group could kind of form around? Um, and I know in, in E16, uh, there is a very kind of specific um, pressure or threat. Um, Mabel, I don't know if you want to um, just say a bit about how, how, how did you even kind of start getting involved with Peach or the CLT? So, um, I was a local resident minding my business, so I was out gardening and then I had, saw two, a lady and a gentleman coming along with a leaflet and says, do you live in uh, that time an Omega house, a Tando house? And when I, when I checked that, I realized that, oh, Tando is my landlord. And I was like, what about my landlord? That is what intrigued me at first. And they said they were having a barbecue to listen to people's issues and concerns they've been having because I live in a private rented accommodation. So we here, most of us, I would say, on the private side, were placed here by New Home Council because these homes are for demolition. But for the past 20 years, the council has decided to lease it on to some rich millionaires to exploit the people that are living here at the moment and I happen to be one of them. So I said, okay, so I went to knock, I was quite, I'm quite open with my neighbors. So I went to knock and said, guys, I've received a leaflet and I think we need to go and find that because it will be good to meet other people that are living here because I, I thought I, it was just within our four square. I didn't realize that there were quite a lot of us. So we went for the barbecue. In addition to the food, we realized that we have a lot of issues. And it came out to be that our housing, um, accommodation in terms of repairs were not being done. And anytime we used to call the council, they keep telling us that we wasn't uh, the uh, resident or candidate. So we need to go back to our landlord. So we felt like, then, first of all, Tando, who was our landlord, was not listening. We had lots of repair issues, dump issues, health issues. And through that meeting, we decided that, okay, let's join this organization because the organization said that they were going to support, support us to fight for our rights as private landlords. And that is how I got involved as well as other people got involved into Peach to fight for our rights to adequate housing, um, affordable housing under the uh, private rented because for once we felt lied to i don't know how people said circumstances were but we were told that once you move to these properties it's temporary you'll be allowed to bid it was only a year or two down the line we realized our bidding was stopped without being informed that we are not allowed to bid and everybody had to fight their own battles why is my bidding closed and you wasn't getting nowhere but we realized that when we came together and we joined peach Peach was able to um, help us with our voices, able to put things, documentation, evidence-based. We were just talking over the phone all the time. However, when we came together, we learned skills. So that is how we came about as a Peach. And through Peach, we, I think there, were, there has been different branches in terms of the co-op they've had uh, for local people in terms of house, uh, sorry, job needs. And there's been education uh, parts as well. So Peach is like a whole branch. It's like an umbrella with different branches coming out of it. Education to support the youth and everything, yeah. Thanks. So Thanks. it was, we call it door to door knocking. So your first step, I would say, is to get to know your area, the people, your neighbors, who they are, how long they've been there, what is their interest. And then from there, set up a group to just to get to know each other. 
And once you know each other and you become as one family, you have common goals and common ambitions, then you can then start doing things as formal, like door to door, recruiting more neighbors to join because the bigger you are, the stronger you are. Thank, thanks, Mabel. Um, yeah, wise word. I had to train as a community organizer, voluntary. So what evenings, oh, my internet, sorry. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, so my evenings, cold evenings, we go and knock neighbor's door. Hi, my name is, give some leaflets. Uh, if you are from the same like background, I'm going through this issue. So we share per personal issues, a summary of our personal issues at the doorstep of people. Oh, hi, I live in a private housing like you. I happen to know that you're the same landlord. Have you got any issues that you would like to share with us if we could help you solve it? And that is how we able to build the group we are today. So that was the first step, it was getting to know everyone and door knocking in the winter cold months. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, I hope that kind of helps to answer your question, Roy. I think um, I'm just going to bring one more, one last person in because we might be able to do some live uh, matchmaking, um, a fellow Wandsworth resident and one of uh, our team at the Hub uh, and also a member of um, Ellsfield CLT uh, is Brendan. So. Um, maybe you can get involved with them. Brendan. Hey, good, e good evening, everybody. Um, it's been great listening for the last hour and a half. Nothing teaches people more about community-led housing than listening to people who are doing it. You know, our technical support we offer in the hub is very clear and it's very process-driven and it teaches you to be a good client. But listening to Sanford, listening to E16 and listening to Crystal Palace, we're actually doing something that's a different type of collaboration, which I think is quite powerful. It brings up questions that we sometimes can't answer, but we should be able to. But also, it is important to understand that there is a process to the development project, whether you're building one house, 10 houses, or whatever the development be. The development process is a journey that starts at that first conversation in the pub that Mabel talks about around your intention. I, we always see it's important to redirect people's energy and curiosity and super community spirit into deliverable actions that allow you to progress through the development stage so you can become a good client like Crystal Palace CLT. They've gone a long way in a year. So I do think that that first question why is you need to find like-minded people and take it more from a, a conversation in the pub around what is your intention around what's happening in local, local Kazi about key workers or about um, generation rent. There's enough language and data and knowledge in our sector to hang your hat on any one of them, but it does take work. You know, um, the hub is an enabling hub to offer advice. Ultimately, you have to do this work. We, we're there with every step of the journey and there is a sequential way of going through it from site finding workshops to development appraisal workshops, the viability workshops, and any groups who are committed will be taken on that journey. So that first conversation that Mabel talks about, and these conversations are really important because it's the art of hosting in your community. And there's a lot of um, energy around communities because of the way communities have reacted to COVID. So we are in a very fertile period to make these conversations material around, and the resources are available to 2023. There is an urgency to get these projects moving because we need to demonstrate that we have projects and set build the capacity in our sector so other people follow suit. If you look at the journey Sanford have been on for so many years, who have been successful, who are going back at it again, you know, these are really important stories in our community, how you affect real change based on empowering communities. Now we can help you all the way and we're very committed to our sector, but ultimately every step has to follow another step and you have to demonstrate your willingness to learn and your knowledge so you become a really good client so when you're standing in front of a local authority asking for a site you know how much that site should be paid for it you know what the capacity is you know how the viability is you know your tenure model so you know how to talk about affordability and then you've got a fighting chance of getting there and then you have to build it you know it's a long journey people think this happens fast but it, once you generate momentum it's hard to stop that so what i say is Look at the way we structure the hub around bringing people into workshops. You are progressed through so we understand how you become that good client. But it's been very inspirational listening to groups. There's no, as I say, 
what I said at the start, there's nothing more powerful than listening to other people's story who are doing it. It gives everybody collaborative learning. So well done, everybody, on the contributions from the panelists tonight. It's been really good. Thanks. Thanks very much, Brendan. Um, yeah, I'm just going to, we're going to close. I'm just going to pass to Dimre to say a few closing words, but I just wanted to thank uh, all of our panelists and attendees for asking such good questions. And um, yeah, over, uh, over to you, Dimre. I don't have much more to add other than saying thank you to everybody who's presented and thank you to everyone who has joined us this evening. We will look to put this up online on our website. Um, please send us a message if you don't want to, if there's any issues that are not being included, if you don't want to be included in that. Um, and we'll share the link around with everybody who was on the call. This is the second one, which uh, second online event we've done of projects we're working with. So the first one was in June um, and we would like to do more. So we really do uh, appreciate and welcome your feedback about these sessions, um, technical <laughs> issues and content included. So if you have any suggestions about the kinds of things that we should be talking about, please email us at info at communitydhousing.london. Our contact details are also available on our website. Um, and it's been great to hear everybody's stories. Um, I really want to do this again soon. Um, so thank you, everybody, and have a lovely evening. <laughs>